just really thankful for those that serve in that kind of a way. And also the praise team. That was just excellent this morning. Thank you for the chance to come and to, to worship, uh, worship the Lord here through, uh, through music. And it's really great to have that, that energy and uh, enjoyment and fun that we have coming together to praise the Lord. You know, it's not a boring thing to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, as I'm here today, uh, one, I'm surprised to see Pastor John. I knew he was out and uh, had asked me to, to be able to come while he's on vacation. And uh, so it's just, uh, it's really nice that he gets a break to be able to, uh, to have some time to sit down. Well, this week, as I was going through, or the last couple weeks, thinking about the, the message, uh, I've got some corrections for you to begin with. So number one, the title in your bulletin is wrong. Okay. Now, I sent it out on Thursday, and it's all my fault, and the passage limit, and all of the other things that are there, and uh, I was just debating about exactly what to go through, and how to, how to title this, and as I went through, I'm sticking with my Gideon story in, Get in Judges chapter 6, we're doing Judges chapter 6 and 7, and the title of the message is, Get Out of the Wine Press. So, we're going to concentrate and look at his promised presence in that passage, but the idea of getting out of the wine press. So it's part of the story as we go. And, and before we dive in to this particular passage in uh, just one of my favorite judges in the book of Judges as we look at it is the lesson that we get from Gideon. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we thank you for your goodness we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be able to come here and worship you. Lord, there is none beside you. There is no one who is worthy of our praise, that is worthy of honor and glory than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we give you that here. and We thank you that we can come and worship you. And now as we dive into your word, I ask that you would open our hearts, that we would see from you and that we would learn from you and, Lord, that Jesus Christ would be honored and glorified above all. Father, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we look at this, I, you know, I had the, the great fear or wonder, how on earth do I cover two chapters in one message and keep everybody awake on the story? So that's what we're going to try and do today is look at kind of the whole story of Gideon here. Well, maybe not the whole thing because we're not getting into the chapter 8 stuff too much. All right? But to be able to look at all that and say, let's boil it down to something from his life that we can take and apply within our lives. Well, the story of Gideon is typical of what's going on in the book of Judges. It starts off with things were okay in Israel. And then Israel went ahead and it says, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then when they did evil, God sends the Midianites. Only it's not just the Midianites. It's the Midianites and it's the Amalekites. And it says, and the other peoples of the east to be able to come and oppress Israel. So they're having a hard time. They're living in caves and doing whatever they can. And, and the Midianites and everybody come in and, and they, they raid the land and take all of the things that they want. And they're under oppression for seven years. And then Israel turns to the Lord. So then after they turn to the Lord, as you go through this, God goes ahead and sends a judge. Now, before he's sending a judge, he sends a prophet who's unnamed to remind them that, by the way, you guys shouldn't be worshiping all of these false gods. And he, but he sends an angel or the angel of the Lord to Gideon. And he talks to Gideon and says, I'm going to send you. And Gideon says, I am not qualified. I have no idea that I'm going to be able to do any of this. As he goes into that story, we're going to look in some of the details of what he says there through that. And yet in the midst of that request, God promises to Gideon his presence through everything God calls him to do. And I think that's key. That's important for he tells him, I will be with you. And then Gideon, in the most famous part of this particular story, says, Lord, I'm not so sure. I need you to kind of confirm that. How about this? I've got this great idea. 
You see, I got this extra fleece sitting over here, all of this wool or whatever, the animal skin and stuff. How about if I throw it outside, and when I come back in the morning, if it's wet and the ground is dry, then I'm going to think that, yeah, you, you, you did this, Lord, and you called. So God does that for Gideon in this story in chapter 6. And Gideon goes out, and he rings out. It says a bowl full. It doesn't tell me how big the bowl is. But the idea is that there's a lot of water in this thing. It is sopping wet, and the ground is dry. And then Gideon sits back, and he thinks about it. And he says, look, a piece of cloth can hold water when everything else sort of evaporates and takes a little bit longer. Maybe I asked for the wrong thing. Maybe that wasn't quite what God meant. So he says, God, don't get mad at me. But can we just reverse that tonight? And let's see what happens. And God does the reverse on that. And so after all of this happens, when Gideon is finally ready to go into battle, he calls up and he has, if you look through the text, you'll see he's got 32,000 people with him. To go against, in chapter 8, it tells us they had about 135,000 of the enemy. It's four to one. And he's ready to go. And God says, oh, by the way, Gideon, you've got too many people. We need to cut that back a little bit. And they try to cut it back once. And then he says, ah, you still have too many people after 22,000 had left. He said, let's do something else. And he brings the number all the way down to 300 against 135,000. If four to one wasn't bad enough, 45 to 1 is unbelievable. But God told Gideon he wanted to get the glory in the midst of, of this upcoming battle. Well, then as we go on in the story, we see that what happens in there is that, that, that God encourages Gideon in the midst of being able to do this, and he takes those 300 men, and he doesn't hand them a sword. He goes ahead and he goes, here, have a torch. Have a, have a piece of pottery, a jar to overcome it. And by the way, we'll hand out a few trumpets too. And it's like, oh, that's great. I've got 300 and I'm bringing the musicians in and a bunch of lights. But he does that and breaks the pottery, shines everything, shouts, blows the trumpet. God causes such great confusion among the enemies that they start to fight each other. Remember, they're from different tri different people groups and different things. You've got the Midianites, the Amalekites, and others. And they're all coming in. God's timing is perfect. They're changing shifts. All of these things are going on. And they, think, and they have this big battle, and Gideon ends up winning the day. In a nutshell, that's the story that we have from chapters 6 and 7 in the book of Judges. But what I'd like to do as we go through this, is understand the key in all of this is not Gideon, but it's God's presence after God called Gideon and he got out of the safety of the wine press. So let's take a look at this in a little bit of detail as we dive in and work our way through this particular passage. So as we go through and we start going back toward the beginning, we have God sending the angel of the Lord. I believe the angel of the Lord is God himself coming down to Gideon in, chapter, in verse 11 of chapter 6. And it says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which is in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abazirite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. The first thing I want to point out is when the angel comes and he talks to Gideon, the first thing he tells him is that the Lord is with him. When God calls us into ministry and service for him, no matter what it might be, the thing that he promises is to be with us. That's the key for anything that we're going to do, whether we share the gospel with our neighbor, whether we get involved in a camp that's coming up on some weekend and whatever it is, it's God's presence with us. 
And he tells Gideon just that up front. He says that the Lord is with you. You know, as God calls Gideon to do this, as we take a look at that, this particular passage, we see that as God is with Gideon, Gideon's first thought is to look at his circumstances. Isn't that what we do? God, I, I would do some more for you in that, but look at, look at what I'm in. I'm not strong enough to do that. I don't have the experience. I don't have the skills. I can't do these things. Look at, if you were really with us, what, you know, why would we have these particular issues and other things that are going on? Look at what he says in verse 13. Gideon says to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. See, he gives that excuse. He gives that reason to be able to say why. And we have that in, when we face a challenge. Is it a challenge at work? Lord, why is this happening to me? What is going on in the midst of, of this circumstance? When the doctor gives a diagnosis that we didn't like or expect. Lord, why is this happening to me? Where are the miracles? Where are the things that happen? And we go to that thought and we forget so often the promise of his presence. And that's the first thing he comes in with Gideon and says, I'm with you. That I am with you. See, Israel was having problems because they had forsaken the Lord and all of the things that, that they had done. And Gideon didn't see all of that, that God had a bigger purpose and a bigger story of what was going on during this time. I'm reading through a book, and I'll reference it again a little bit later. Uh, right now, David Platt in his book, Follow Me. And in there, he says that God doesn't call us to a life of superficial religion, but rather be changed by supernatural regeneration. That's the work God is doing in your heart and in my heart as he calls us to walk with him, but he doesn't call us alone. He says, I will be with you. So Gideon has the promise of God's presence, but there's another promise in that same verse that stands out to me. Take a look again in chapter 6, verse 12. And it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. He says, You mighty man of valor. I want you to think about what Gideon is doing right now. I've got a picture here of a, of a wine press. It's in the corner, but there's a bigger one here. There's a wine press. And in that wine press, it says that he's threshing wheat. Now, the threshing of wheat is separating the wheat kernels from the, the head of the grain. All right? And they'll do it. Sometimes you'll see maybe they'll do it with a flail that they take, which is a long stick. And they grab the stick, and it's got like a, a rope and another section of the stick, and they hit it, and they break the kernel apart, or just pound it with a stick, or pick up the, 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 the straw with it, and they'll go ahead and they'll smack that to go ahead and separate the wheat from the stalk. And then after that, they do the winnowing, which is when they toss it up in the air, and they allow the wind to be able to blow that. Now, how many of you like to carry things twice when you could carry it once? If you're going to move somebody and they say, well, just move it over there and then we'll load it up later. No, let's just load it in the truck right away. Let's get all the stuff in the right spot at the right time up front. That's what we want to do. All right? Other times it's move the furniture here and there and all, all, all of those things. All right? But in, so when you're going to go ahead and you're going to thresh wheat, you want to do it on top of the hill where the wind is blowing so that you can go ahead and move into the winnowing process. You don't go down into a pit of a wine press, which is at the bottom of the hill, so they can carry the grapes to the bottom, and then they go ahead and they, they tra you know, trample on them, and you can see the little pit in the center where the, the, the wine or the juice of the grapes would then gather. And stuff. You don't go down to the bottom unless you're scared of the Midianites. 
Gideon was scared of the Midianites. As we take a look at this particular passage, that's exactly what it tells us that he was doing, that he was threshing wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Gideon had good reason to be afraid. We learn in chapter 8, after he captures some of the kings of the Midianites, and he has them here, and he asks them, what kind of men were they in Tabor that you slew? He tells them, well, they looked like you and all this other stuff. He goes, there's a good reason they looked like me. They were my brothers. Gideon had reason to be afraid, and we think there's reason for us maybe to get into our wine press and say, I'm just going to hide, Lord. I'm not going to be able to step out and to do these things. But God is calling Gideon out of the wine press, and he says, not only that I am with you, but in this, he sees Gideon not as Gideon sees himself, as a scared young man in a wine press saying, what can I do? But he sees him as a mighty man of valor. Do we catch that? When God calls us to be able to do something and we have his promise, he doesn't see us as we might see ourselves as we are, but he sees us as who he is making us to be. Isn't that exciting? That God is going to see, you know what? We think so little that we can't do that, but God calls us as he sees us becoming through his mighty work. You think about Gideon, not, or not only Gideon, I'm thinking about some of the, the apostles. Think about Peter. Peter is there, and when he first gets called, he says, Lord, depart from me, I am a sinful man. And God tells him, you're going out here for fish? I am going to make you a fisher. This is the same Peter who denies the Lord three times, but he's also the same one that the Lord says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. He sees something in Peter that he is going to make Peter become before Peter even knows he's on the journey. God sees us as he will make us. Let's trust him. If I'm going to trust somebody that's with me, I want somebody that's going to be that way. Don't you? as he sees us and he calls us and he works in us and he equips us and we see that he calls Peter and he uses him in that way. Gideon is the same way. If we take a look at Gideon, we see that the first thing, God gives him a mission to be able to do. The first mission that he gives him in this story of Gideon is to go ahead and tear down the altar of Baal. This isn't just any altar to Baal. It's the altar of Baal that his father built. It's in his household. It's all of those things that are there. And he goes on in verse 25 of chapter 6, and he says this. Now it came to pass in the same night, the Lord said to him, that is the Lord said to Gideon, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. I love the irony there. It's like... Oh, yeah, go, by the way, take the God to burn it for the sacrifice that you're going to make to the real God. And he goes on, so Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. And this is the part I want to key in on. It says, but because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Gideon was afraid. He was scared. He's also the one the Lord said, mighty man of valor, go and do this. Well, the key on this is Gideon went and did it in faith, trusting the Lord in spite of his fears. And he went at night and he did these things. And in the end, the family that he thought would be against him, his father ended up supporting him in the midst of this 
and he goes ahead and tells him. When the people wanted to go ahead and kill Gideon for having do, do this, he went ahead in verse 31, but Joash said to all who stood against him, would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down. Therefore, on that day, he, call, he called him Jeroboam, saying, let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. So they gave Gideon a nickname, and that gets to my next slide, which this is, this is fairly hot off the press that came up at that particular time. On this next slide, you will see that there is something that came up. And you see that's a little piece of pottery. And in the bottom, you can see how big it really is uh, there. But that piece of pottery is dated to about 1100 BC, about the time of Gideon. And it says Jeroboam. That's not a common name. That was an insult to Gideon, say, let Baal contend with him, and I don't think they thought he would live very long. But when God showed himself faithful in Gideon, what became it, what was thought of as an insult, became a compliment and a name of power. Baal couldn't contend with Gideon because he is no God. Gideon became the defeater, the one that came over the Baal or the false god. And we see his name in this piece of pottery, which I found quite interesting as we look at that. And we want to consider the fact that here is historical evidence outside of Scripture that this was found in an article that I just read in June that one of, uh, one of the people in my Bible study gave to me to, to be able to share. Hey, did you see this about Gideon? All right confirmation of Gideon as a historic person in Scripture. I love it when I sit down and I see those kinds of things. But God called Gideon, called him a mighty man of valor. He was afraid, and yet he still did what God called him to do. See, in referencing the call of Abraham, Romans chapter 4, verse 17, it says this, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him who believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now that's a rough wording in English as I sit down and I go through this passage. But what he's telling us there is that to, when God spoke to Abraham, he called him a father of many nations when Abraham didn't have any children. How was that going to be possible? But when God said it, he called into existence the thing that wasn't around as if it was around and going to happen. When he looks at Gideon, he calls him a mighty man of valor, which Gideon is not showing any of the signs of a mighty man of valor at this time. But God called him into that because that's what he's making him to be. The same thing happens in our lives when God calls us who knows what he is calling you to be? God does. Maybe you're the mighty children's worker or the mighty and the, the, the powerful evangelist as you just share your faith with your neighbor. Maybe you are the great encourager as God uses you to encourage someone else going through a difficulty and you're using the gifts that God has given to you. He promises his presence and he sees us as he will make us. That brings us to the third point in this. As I've been emphasizing God's presence, God emphasizes it as well. Take a look back as we look at this in chapter 3, verse 16. The Lord says to him, here, and the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midian, Midianites as one man. He had told him earlier in this chapter, in verse 12, that I am with you, and he reiterates that point in chapter 6, verse 16. He doesn't want Gideon to forget the fact that he is going to be with him. 
sometimes we forget that. The Lord doesn't promise that everything is going to be easy, but he promises to be with us in the midst of the storm. I look at a lot of different things, and we look at, I like the calling of Moses in Exodus chapter 3. I think that's a lot of fun when you sit there and he's, he's up there, and God tells a reluctant Moses who's being sent back to Egypt to go ahead and go, and that I'm going to be with you. And this is how it comes out in chapter 3, verse 11. It says, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. You remember the picture. It's Moses as he's there, and he's on the mountain, and, 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 and there's the fiery bush that is there, and, and he's trying to get out of it. And God says, with certainty, I will be with you. The interesting thing I find about this, as we look at it, is that in giving him the promise, Moses doesn't know about all of the plagues that are going to happen and all of the things that God is going to do as signs while he's there in Egypt. But the promise he gives him is that you will come and worship on this mountain. I don't know about you, but I, I, I like my promises to be in reverse. Before all the other things happen, rather than after. He's saying, after you've done everything I've called you to do, you're going to know that I called you to do it because you're going to come here to worship. I'd be like, Lord, that's a little backwards. That you're going to call me to look backward and see your hand in the midst of it. And yes, that is what God does so often. That he calls us to walk with him and to serve him. And sometimes we don't even see it as we're going and we're saying, Lord, I need each step of the way. Please be with me and guide me. And then we turn and we look back and we see his hand through every step. It's that poem of footprints that we say, Lord, how come you weren't with me in the difficult times? There's only one set of footprints back here. He says, those are the times I carried you. It's that kind of thing that he promises to Moses. That's what he's doing as he deals with Gideon. That's how he deals with us. We need to walk in faith, knowing the promise of his presence, seeing that, that he sees us as he's going to make us, recognizing that we need that, and he's going to reaffirm that promise of his presence. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, God tells Joshua, he says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. That leads us to chapter 13, verse 5 in Hebrews, where he writes there and he repeats that section. It says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You remember the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20. He says that. He goes on, he goes, teaching them to observe all things as I have commanded you. And he says, and lo or yet, or whatever your translation is, I am with you always. See, the key is when we're going to serve God, we have to, and he goes, even to the end of the age. So he carries it, it to the end. And we need to remember and to be able to stand in his presence. You see, the answer to fear is his it's not being strong enough or courageous enough. It's his presence. And that is the promise of his presence is the thing that separates Christianity from other religions around the world. I had mentioned David Platt in his book. And I'd like you to, uh, there's one section that he has here where he goes through where in Follow Me, he shares an encounter that he had with four different religions. And he goes through this Way. With the Hindus, they have the Vedic traditions, including the healing powers of the Ganges River that people will go to wash in and to be able to see that. It goes on to the Muslims have their five pillars of things that they need to be able to, to do and count on. Their faith, prayers, charity, fasting, and the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca. The Buddhists, they have the monks have this eightfold path of right views, right aspirations, right speech, right conduct 
right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right contemplation. And they need to follow these things in order to get to peace or to nirvana. The Sikhs have the teachings of the ten gurus to go ahead and follow. And they, they all point to the same thing. But they have a shared common denominator in all of them, whether it's a teacher or a series of teachers of things. But it's a bunch of rules to go ahead and follow. And Jesus, as he calls us, he doesn't say, follow these rules. He says, follow me. And he promises to be with us through that. He promises that he sees us as we are going to be as he makes us. And he reiterates that promise to us of his presence. Well, he doesn't just leave us there and think that's, that's good enough. So if we go on to the next slide, this will be the last one to kind of cap everything. We see the promise of his presence. God sees us as he will make us. We see that God reaffirms the promise of his presence. And fourthly, God encourages us in his service. He encourages us as we go along. And we see that as it stands up. If you look at Gideon as a whole story, you start to see this. In chapter 6, verse 17, at the very beginning, when, when God comes to him, by the terebinth tree. And he goes, and, and Gideon asks him, and he says to him in verse 17, he says, now if I found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that is you who talk to me. Then he goes on in verse 21. It says, the angel of the Lord, after Gideon, the sign was Gideon went and prepared a meal, and he brought it all up, and he set it all on the stone, and you know, he prepared the lamb, and he prepared some bread and everything else. And then he comes, and the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat, the unleavened bread, and the fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Verse 22, now Gideon perceived that it was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And then Gideon went and built an altar in worship to God at that time. God encouraged Gideon. Gideon, who he called the mighty man of valor, who was cowering in the wine press. God encouraged him through that sign. We already talked about the fleece briefly as kind of the famous part of the story. But Gideon knew God had called him, and in the midst of that, twice he asks for a sign of a fleece, and he reiterates it a little bit. And we don't get God saying, look, I already burned the food that you set before me. And he doesn't say, really, I need to show you this again after the first time? Sometimes I might do that with my kids. I've made mistakes with my kids, and it's like, come on, you didn't catch this when I taught it to you the first time? God is patient with Gideon, and he teaches him, and he gives him that encouragement and says, look, I know you're going to do it. I know who I'm making you to be. You need a little encouragement right here. I get that. And he gives it to him. Then after God has him reduce the armies all the way down to 300 men, can you imagine that? I'd be wondering, Lord, what on earth did you call me to? I'm trying to do all this. Yeah, I saw all that, but I am scared. But I'm probably just as afraid to ask you for another one of those signs that I've been so uh, frequently coming to you for. But this is what I love in this passage. Take a look in chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. Chapter 7, verse 9, he says... And it happened the same night, this is after he's getting ready to go into battle and tell him, the Lord said to him, arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered into your hand. And then God says in verse 10, but if you are afraid to go down to the camp, afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. I love that passage. Gideon didn't have to ask. God knew Gideon was scared stiff. He said, Lord, I, I think I'm going to go this, but I could use a little encouragement here, but he didn't ask. And God knows every word before it's ever even on our tongue. 
He knows these things in advance. And he says, Gideon, I encouraged you before when you asked. I'm going to encourage you when you didn't ask. And he goes on in verse 11. He continues and says, Then he went down with Porah his servant to the outpost of the armed men who were in camp. Now the Midianites and Amalekites and all the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. And he came to a tent and he struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And so it was that when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, that he worshipped. God encourages Gideon. And in the midst of this encouragement, I, you know, he gives a little detail that it's a, a, a barley loaf that comes down. That was the poor man's bread. That's what the boy had in the, in the New Testament when they said, hey, we got this kid's lunch. He's got these five barley loaves and fish. It was the poor lunch. And they understood that this was Gideon or God working in Gideon was going to be there. God was preparing things that Gideon had no idea of until this point. That he was working on the other side. He was getting, they were ready to attack one another before Gideon ever blew a single trumpet because God was at work. But he knew Gideon needed that encouragement, and he brought it on without Gideon even asked, asking for it. You know what? When we're faithful, when we get out of the wine press of fear and doubt and difficulty that we're in, we're saying, Lord, I'm going to follow you because this is what you've called me to do. He brings along that encouragement. We just need to have our eyes open to look around and see that encouragement. And when we see and we recognize the encouragement of God, we need to worship. I remember early on when I was like, I, I was in seminary, I was finishing up, and I had the opportunity to go preach at another church. And at this particular church I went, and it was a, a church that they didn't have a building, they were, they were meeting in a theater, and as we're there in the theater, it was, it was the opening weekend for one of the Star War, new Star Wars movies, I think it might have been like episode one. And so therefore the theater was open. So you walked in in the morning to the smell of popcorn and everything. And I'm trying to preach a sermon with the lightsabers in the background. <laughs> All the other stuff going on. They don't teach you how to deal with that in seminary. It never came up. And as I was there and I had finished that message, it was probably the worst message I thought I ever had delivered. I'm like, Lord, I'm just not so sure you can use me to preach. I don't know that I have it. And God moved in the heart of one of the people that was there, and he gave me something. He said, God just told me to give this to you. I thought he was giving me a little card of encouragement or a little note. And when I later opened up what it was, he had given me a $100 bill at the Congress. And I looked at that 100 and I said, why? God said, John, you need this encouragement right now because I'm calling you into this ministry. I want, there's things I have for you to do, and you need to know that. And I'll worship God. God will bring those kinds of things. Well, in conclusion, here we go. As we take a look at this, what are the comfortable pits God may be calling you out of? Shyness, our job, I'm afraid of what's going to happen there. You know, the house, the situation I'm in. Maybe it's just a fear that I'm not good at teaching. Yeah, I'm not good with children or that. I, I can't. I, Things are too busy at work. I can't give that up to take some time to go do some, some other things in ministry. Maybe it's my own physical limitations and say, I physically can't do some of these things, Lord. Well, you know, what? Let God take care when he calls us. He promises his presence. He sees us as he's going to make us. He reaffirms that promise of his presence. And as we need it, he encourages us along the road. As he encourages us, I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, where it says that we have a, a great high priest who is not unable to sympathize with our weakness. But he can sympathize with it. He suffered everything as we have, yet without sin. 
he understands where we're at and brings that encouragement. So as the praise team comes up, I want you to just really think about as we get ready here to, to close out the service, to say, Lord, is there a wine press you want me to get out of? Is there something that's hindering me and keeping me from service? I, if I ask Pastor John, I'm sure he would be able to tell me, there are some areas of ministry needs that we might have at this church. There are things that we can do on our own that God calls us to be able to do in service to him. And so as we just prepare ourselves, let's be open to be able to say, Lord, I want to trust in your presence above all and see what it is that you're going to be making me to do. So as we go through this and, and we think about that, let's just have a word of prayer as we, we finish up here. Dear Heavenly Father, as we're just here, we, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for Gideon and all that you taught him. Lord, for the lesson that this man who was fearful, Lord, is one that you took and you worked within his heart. Lord, you got him out of the wine press to go serve you. And Lord, that you were with him. And we thank you for that. I just pray for each of us, Lord, as we consider what you're doing in our lives to help us to step out in faith. Lord, whether it's out of a wine press or like Peter out of a boat or whatever it might be, Lord, let us follow you. Let us serve you. Let us know your presence. Lord, draw us to yourself that we might know you more. Help us to recognize the things that you're doing in our lives as you encourage us along the way that we might give worship and praise to you. So Lord, I pray for this church. I ask you to continue to be with Cross Life and with the ministries here and with the individuals that are, that that you have brought here to worship you, Lord, that we all might grow together in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and step out of whatever wine pits it is that are holding us back in fear that we might walk with you. For it's in the great name of Jesus that we pray.